Welcome back to The Future of Transportation, the podcast where we explore how technology, policy, and innovation are reshaping how we move through the world. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Nick Karos, a transportation planner, data scientist, and sustainable mobility advocate. He works to solve global transportation challenges. Nick currently leads data-driven transportation policy analysis at the International Transport Forum, OECD. He recently completed his PhD at MIT, where he focused on adapting urban transportation systems and land use for the future of work. He holds engineering degrees from UBC and NYU and brings a wide range of experience spanning heavy civil construction, transportation planning consulting, and international policy research. Welcome to the future of transportation. Thanks uh, so much, Sophia. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining. So we can start off with your origin story. So why did you pick transportation? So you started your engineering studies at UBC and NYU. What first drew you to the world of transportation? Yeah, so I initially didn't set out to be a transportation planner or engineer. Um, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, uh, I was in mechanical engineering. And I actually went and got my first job, um, as you mentioned, in sort of heavy civil construction, um, doing the kind of calculations to see whether, you know, a crane could actually lift a particular object um, on the construction site. But um, I was looking for a career change. And one of the, the construction projects that I'd worked on was actually a highway construction project near my hometown, actually kind of connecting uh, my hometown to the major city that was nearby. And it struck me how much people were excited about the fact that I was working on this highway expansion project that made it easier for them to get to work. Um, and it really kind of drove home to me, like how much transportation really affects people's lives and can create you know, a huge change um, in their quality of life. So when I was looking for the career change, I thought, okay, you know, maybe transportation is a good way to apply my sort of engineering background. Um, and so I ended up going to NYU to do a master's degree. Um, and that's where I really fell in love with transportation, I would say. Well, I think some people always say like transportation is a field that's kind of hidden, but everyone has an opinion about. So it makes a lot of sense when you're working on the highway project, you see the real world impact that it has on other people's lives. Yeah, exactly. And it's something that, like you said, everybody has an opinion about. So it's really fun to kind of tell people what you do for a living. And then they are always like, oh, man, you know, the, the train was delayed this morning or, you know, I have such a tough time getting to where I need to go. Um, or, you know, maybe they have a positive story, too. And so uh, it is it is really cool to be able to work on something that, you know, really affects everybody's lives, whether it's, you know, the president of uh, the country or, you know, um, just people trying to, to go and pick up their kids after school. Yeah. Like, I think Professor Zhao also said, like, transportation is half engineering and half human behavior. So the human aspect is also very, very important. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, really, honestly, why I decided uh, to go to the MIT for my PhD, actually, was that I was really attracted to the interdisciplinary nature of the program there. So in a lot of schools, the PhD program for transportation is really in the trend is either there's either a transportation program in engineering, and then there's one in like the policy or the um, urban planning school. But at MIT, it's an interdisciplinary program. Um, so you actually have to take classes from both the kind of policy side and from the engineering side. And I think that just makes, you know, for a more well-rounded and kind of better um, either planner or engineer, whatever you're planning on becoming when you uh, move on. Um, and it's also, I think, really important to understand both because, you know, from my perspective, at least, I think a lot of the engineering side of transportation um, has, you know, more or less been solved. I think we know how to make pretty good transportation systems these days. There's always ways you can improve and there's some really exciting stuff um, coming down, you know, the pike in terms of technology. But I think the bigger challenge is actually how do you take those technical solutions and actually translate them into policies and investments and, you know, real life infrastructure that improves people's lives. So um, having a good understanding of how kind of both sides of that equation work. Um, and, you know, as Professor John mentioned, also the, the human behavior component of it is really important. Um, but understanding those different dimensions of transportation, I think is really key. Well, you perfectly segued into my next question, which was about your PhD at MIT, which is where we met. So um, we can also just move to the next part, which is now that you're working at the International Transport Forum at the OECD, can you tell us about the organization's mission and what kind of work you do there? 
Yeah, of course. So I came to the ITF, uh, the International Transport Forum, um, actually as an intern in 2022. And then I uh, came back full time once I finished my PhD uh, a couple of years later, or about a year later. Um, and that was around the time that you and I started working together, too. Um, so that was uh, a particularly uh, exciting time. But I um, so the ITF is part of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is based in Paris, um, the OECD. And the overall tagline for the ITF um, is that we work for transport policies that improve people's lives. So really what we do is try to improve the understanding of you know, how transportation actually affects quality of life from you know, economic growth to social inclusion to the quality of the air that we breathe. Um, and then we also try to just raise the overall profile of transport policy across the world because, you know, you and I can sit here and and uh, get really nerdy about, you know, transportation policy. But and for a lot of people, it's not really at the top of mind. Um, so we try to make that more salient to people. Um, and so, like, in general, the ITF sort of has two primary functions. One is to act as like a think tank that does research and publish that research. And then the other is to act as a platform for people to gather and discuss uh, transport issues, and in particular, um, transport ministers from countries across the world. So every year we have um, the ITF summit, which happens in Germany, and that, you know, the transport ministers from our member countries um, all converge there to start discussing, you know, what the latest issues are in transportation policy. But my role is on the research side. So I try to help our member countries and you know the other stakeholders really understand and hopefully solve their current transportation challenges. So that could be anything from like how to use data from e-scooter operators to make better regulations, or you know which ports in Southeast Asia are more at risk from climate change. Um, so for the public um, who might not interact with the ITF all that much. We do produce a lot of interesting reports. They're all free and available online. Um, also some other types of media, so like video interviews with different experts, data sets that you can use for research, um, you know, public dashboards and other products like that. So I would encourage anyone uh, to go and check out the ITF website to see uh, what we've been working on lately. Well, um, one question that I, I didn't put on our question list, but I would love to ask you is what is the difference since you said you're working on the research at ITF, what is the main difference between your research work, if there is any, at ITF versus in a university lab such as MIT? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, at the ITF, we have less of an impetus to produce something that's like extremely, you know, on the cutting edge of technology or of research, um, you know, applying like really brand new methods. Um, a lot of what we can do, and I think kind of our secret sauce as an organization, is that we have access to different experts all over the world through our member countries. So a lot of what we do is sort of consolidate, um, interview people, try to identify best practices from around the world, and then assemble those into like really easily digestible information for policymakers. Um, so to give you an example, like I'm working right now on a report on urban demand management. Um, so this is like a pretty broad topic. It's something that's been well understood and sort of practiced now for, I don't know, 70, 80 years. Um, so most people kind of understand what you can do when it comes to urban demand management. Um, but I think some of the bigger challenges lately have been on like, how do you actually implement it well and, you know, sustain political support? So you've seen, for example, like the congestion pricing in New York. Um, that is an example of urban demand management. It's been quite controversial. It's gone through many different stages of approval and maybe not approval. And, you know, um, it's been a little bit tough to build and maintain support for it, even though it's been, you know, wildly successful. And you know, I think it's a great initiative. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, reach out to all of our member countries around the world and particular experts and understand their experiences trying to implement stuff like this. Um, and, you know, what made it successful? What did they do they wish they did differently? Um, and then we can publish that in a report so that if, you know, next year, um, some other country or city would like to do something like congestion pricing, they can reference this report and maybe learn from those experiences. Because a lot of the times, those like, policy experiences don't necessarily make it into, um, you know, a, a research report, or even any sort of publicly available information. Um, it's just sort of, stays in the, you know, um, the memories and the experiences of the people who are involved, but doesn't really get out there into the world. So I, I would say that's sort of what we do um, 
it's been, and, and how it's a little bit different, I guess, than uh, maybe like a academic page. That makes a lot of sense. So it's like giving a platform to those those voices that originally might not be heard. Yeah, and I should say also we have a pretty strong quantitative modeling team at the ITF as well. So we do do a lot of forecasting, um, and we use like our expertise in um, that to kind of project what might happen in the future. So every two years we do a um, transport outlook, which looks ahead like thirty or forty years to say like what do we see as the trends in you know. Um, electric vehicle adoption and how is that going to impact um, carbon emissions from transport, you know, in 2050 or 2060, um, and how does that differ depending on the different regions of the world? Um, and so we can also produce original knowledge using this. That's a bit maybe more like an academic exercise, um, but again, I think our access to experts all over the world really helps us do that because we can actually come up create these models that have, you know, relatively good data inputs from all kinds of different regions um, and actually, you know, provide some level of confidence around these projections.